Hello and welcome to John Miller, Marketing Counsel at NBC Universal. So welcome, John. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of the chair of the NBC Universal Marketing Council. I had been a CMO uh, for a number of years, but I sort of gave up a CMO official CMO title, as as you sort of know it. Uh, but the the Marketing Council is uh, created of marketers throughout NBC Universal and Comcast through all of our businesses. And the goal is to have everybody get together to create a, utilize the scale of NBC Universal and Comcast for individual properties so that the marketers would actually, strangely enough, work together rather than <laughs> against each other, which was is a, uh, an anomaly in big media. Um, and and it, it has worked pretty well. Um, and we can get a little bit more into that, but that's, that's yeah. really what I do. Well, and so help us understand the path, uh, your career path. So you've been at, at some version of NBC for 40 years, and you've held a number of pretty amazing and interesting different roles. So give us like the quick tour of okay. the 40 then, years. Uh, I, okay. 40 years. Okay, I will do the quick, the clip notes <laughs> version of it. Um, I actually did start at the NBC television station in Chicago. I was raised in Chicago and uh, got that job. My first job was like producing the meditations and public service messages. Um, then went on to doing some production, local production, and I was tasked with uh, being a uh, person that took over on-air promotion at the Chicago television station by the general manager. Um, then they determined that I was doing a pretty good job at it. They offered me the job. Uh, the CBS station a few months later hired me away to do the same job over there. Um, I was at that was WBBM Chicago. I became the promotion manager there, and the um, uh, CBS uh, network asked if I would come in as director of affiliate marketing. Uh, then I went to do that for a year. Uh, the, the the person who had hired me said, "I think you'd like you to go to New York and be head of advertising for CBS News." I did that for a year. That was right around the Cronkite um, rather transition. So mm -hmm. interesting time. Long time ago, many people won't even remember that. We have to go and look in the history books for that one. Um, and then the guy who hired me, a guy named Steve Somer, brought me back to NBC as vice president of affiliate marketing out there. He then got a job, and then I became head of marketing for the West Coast, which is basically the NBC Entertainment Division, primetime, late night, daytime children's programming. He then left to, to uh, be a uh, president of Columbia Pictures, and then I took over marketing of the full television network. And this is like the 84, 85 time, mm -hmm. um, where my first season was to launch like the Cosby Show and Highway to Heaven and the Miami Vice and wow. um, Hunter and some great shows. And um, then had that, I was reporting to a guy named Brandon Tartikoff, a sort of legendary in the, in the television yeah. business. And um, then I took on some development work at, in um, 89. And then um, in, two, in uh, 1990, uh, they asked me to go to New York as a head of marketing for both sales marketing as well as consumer marketing, because I had done some projects with advertisers that had brought in a significant amount of money in the sales marketplace. Did that for about a year and a half. Um, Brandon left, a guy named Warren Littlefield came in as head of entertainment, and he asked me to come back to that point. And, and won't get into all the reasons of why I went there and when I came back, but when I came back, I took on uh, daytime and children's programming as well as um, all marketing for the, the television network at that point. And um, I eventually gave up daytime and took on primetime specials. Somewhere along the line, we started doing work for other parts of the company, as well as a number of uh, dot coms that had come in uh, for inventory for equity swaps, and we won a national Emmy. The first Emmy that was ever won for a commercial, we, we did that and won a, won a variety of other awards. And then the rest of the company said, well, we'd like to utilize your work. And we were acting as sort of an agency. So I formalized the process and became president of the NBC agency. We were in-house agency doing work for all divisions of NBC, Bravo, CNBC, MSNBC, um, Telemundo, uh, syndication, and the like, and continued to do that through the early 2000s when NBC merged with NBC Universal. At that point, I became CEO, I was CMO of the um, uh, NBC Universal Television Group, and formed the Marketing Council. At that point, uh, NBC and um, uh, Universal coming together, uh, I, along with a guy named Mark Schmugger, who was running marketing for Universal Pictures, was charged with probably trying to utilize the power of the company. 
And we looked around and saw a significant amount of dysfunction at the marketing of, of our big media competitors. Mm. And I had experienced a lot of it. And so we, what we tried to do is put together something that would utilize the scale of the company so that everybody gives, everybody gets, not entirely reciprocal. Um, and what happened was everybody wanted time on the television network. Since I controlled the time on the television network, <laughs> I, could, I could control the culture. And at that point, it was more important to me to have the company succeed than me succeed. I had already succeeded. I, I, I wanted to now do something for the, the company that was different. So we created the NBC Universal Marketing Council and almost immediately we found great success by uh, doing that. Uh, fast forward uh, to like 2010, 11, uh, Comcast purchased NBC Universal. Now we had six more channels. We had the power of Comcast. We had um, additional websites. And at its peak, um, we had 18 channels and the power of Comcast. Uh, we had the um, websites that delivered about 180 million uniques a month. So we, we could really drive a scale. And so whether it was uh, launching a, a movie or a theme park ride or um, uh, any television show or other brand activity, we could pull the entire company together and we created a full calendar. So there's something going virtually every day of the year, usually divided by weeks. Uh, we had different categories that we would select based on what the importance was. And that's sort of what I still do now. Uh, after I, at, in 2010, I gave up marketing of the television network and the NBC agency, was ready to leave, but they asked me to stick around a little while to continue to do the marketing council work. Also, uh, the, the sports group was combining at a certain point and I had marketed the Olympics and the, the person who was at, there at the time, a guy named Dick Eversall, asked me to stick around for a couple of years. I did, he, he then shortly left and uh, not at my own choosing, but I all of a sudden became CMO of the NBC <laughs> Sports Group. So I did that and I continued to do the Olympics and I've marketed, I think 13 different Olympics. Um, and then I, I sort of stayed in that role through Rio, uh, co-contributed to a new person that came in as CMO of the Sports Group um, for Pyeongchang. And then after Pyeongchang, I basically just sort of limited what I do to the marketing council. Um, and it was just because I've been around so long and uh, I can get people to work together in a collaborative manner and understand how things work in virtually all of the businesses. Um, I've maintained that and uh, I've wanted to leave several times, but I sort of keep being asked to stick around. And so I'm, I'm, I'm here at least to the end of the year. And um, then, then I'll see. It's, it's sort. Of, fortunately, it's been my choice. So, um, we'll, we'll see what goes forward. But that's a quick. It's about as quick as I could make wow. it. Wow. Well, that's, that, I appreciate that background, and it actually leads me really nicely to my next question, which you maybe tangentially answered. But it's so. What would you say your superpower is in terms of you know? I think I believe that everybody has a superpower, and I'm curious what yours is. You know, other than, than than hard work and a little bit of a sense of humor, um, I would say that collaboration and creativity are the mm -hmm. combination of those two things. Um, and you know, in, in these businesses, you you have to be willing to learn, because when I ran the marketing, the television network, and I also did those things as I described. But it was 25 years, and then people would say, "Well, gee, what was it like having the same job for 25 years?" And I said. It was, more, it was never more than the same job for one year. Right. It, it, quite honestly, the, the, the shows changed, the people changed, the business changed, the consumption patterns changed. It, when I started, there were three networks. Now you can't count how many different services there are. It's a completely different landscape. And so I have sort of trans, transversed a sort of the overall time. So the combination of, I think, create creativity, because I think you need that as a marketer, um, collaboration, clearly in my role, I had to bring it together. And then also the the ability to understand that the world is going to change and you better change with it. Yep, absolutely. So what piece of advice do you either wish that you had gotten earlier in your career or would you give somebody that's relatively new in their marketing career? Well, I, I think that the, <clears throat> I say this because I, I, I taught, um, and I thought I might leave at one point, I taught uh, uh, an adjunct professor course at a Carnegie Mellon out on the West Coast where I was at the time. And for the young people who are getting in, I would basically say to them, first of all, get a job at a place where you think you can grow mm -hmm. and just do the best you can and look around to every concentric circle. And I would say this is probably regardless of where you are in your career. 
and then learn everything from a concentric circle. And then in the next job, you will have already learned what you need to do because you will have been in sort of study. It's sort of almost a graduate program. And a sing your first job is just a dot. The second, the second one creates a line, a direction in your career. And that often sets you on a certain, certain path. And so my sense is never stop learning. I think that's probably the thing yeah. I would say to anybody else. Curiosity is a huge value. It's a value for my company, but it's also a personal value, which is, you know, constant growth learning, yes. be, be, a be a student your whole life. Your yes, whole you, and, and don't assume you know it all. Uh, rely on your, your team and anybody else to, to, to give you information. And, and so speaking of that, where do you find inspiration? And where do you, or do you, where do you find inspiration for your team too? Well, um, I, I, there's, inspiration happens in all sorts of different places in all sorts of different ways. I think that the, 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 the work and ideas of the, the team often can provide inspiration. Um, we live in a very competitive world and you, you, the, to, to succeed in it, you have to have some competitive spirit. And I think that can offer some, some inspiration and some, some drive. And then also as marketing is largely determined how, by a combination of str strategy as well as creative, uh, I often think that uh, being a creative and, and studying creative and, and continuing being a student of that mm -hmm. um, provides a level of inspiration that can make it work. And then I also think new tactics from marketing things that people do uh, are off, can often be very inspiring and, and, and people can be too. Absolutely. So you talked a little bit about team and, and the value of team. So how do you coach and mentor your team or how have you throughout the years? Well, um, I think that, you know, I, this, this is a question that you, you gave me ahead of time. And I actually wrote a couple of things down because I thought this right. was sort of important. Um, and if, if I could find this one, it says, I, I think that one of the things is, is um, uh, one is don't be afraid to, to fail, um, learn, um, and uh, don't think you know it all. I think that was maybe something that I answered before was the, the other part was listening, um, inspiration to, to your people, um, provide clear direction and ultimately make a decision. Yeah. Um, you know, at a certain point, somebody needs to decide and say, okay, I've got all the input. We're headed this way. Right. And um, I, I think that in, in, as, as being a leader, you want to listen and um, also teach at the same time. I, I, there's, there's sometimes when people would do this and say, oh, just do it. And I, I think it's always important to say why you're doing it. And um, what, what do we hope to achieve by this? And, what the, and then, okay, we're gonna use these tactics and these strategies to go achieve it. And that's what we're gonna do. So I, I always try to bring people into the process as much as possible so that they would own it and that we would all be swimming in the same direction, try to succeed with whatever project we wanted to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of values, we talk a little, we haven't talked really about it, but we talked about leadership and the team. So what are the most important values that you can demonstrate as a leader or what values are you looking for in your team, you know, for people well, to hire? Well, I, I, you know, I think that the, 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 the basic sort of human ones is you want somebody who's honest and truthful and ultimately um, not afraid to challenge you a little bit. I, I used something in the early part of my career, and I, I think I learned this from a boss, just sort of being around him, something I call the double no rule. And, you know, usually somebody comes to pitch something to you and says, I think we should do this. or And you initially sometimes, because it may not seem right or not on target, you say, no, nah, I'm just not sure about that. And the weak ones will say, oh, okay, and then it's kind of leave. The, the ones who really believe in themselves and have a strong uh, conviction in their ideas will say, you know, I hear what you're saying, but let me give you one more reason why I think this should really work. And they will go again and, and then you say, yeah, maybe they're right, they believe in it. Okay, take a shot. <laughs> and then, and, uh, or it says, it, it is so off base and you think it's gonna cost too much money <laughs> and it's really off target and you say, I hear you, but no, we're, we're not yeah. gonna do that. Now at that point, you, it's, it's good to move on. Right. There are, those, there are those people who will not do a two no and will go after three and four. And now you're just pissing me off. 
Right, right, right. right. Now you're, so, you're going, yeah, you've moved yeah, to annoying. You're, you're, you're just sort of wasting our time now. Yeah. Uh, but you really appreciate the person that has gone the extra thing that they, they come in and they heard one yeah. no, but they're not going to take one no for an answer. They're going to go two no. And I think that that provides a good balance between employer and employee um, to make sure that they, they, they get a voice and then get a second voice. And if it's not yeah. right, it's not a strategy, you move on and then you say, okay, I tried. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, I, so that's one of the things that I've, I've tried to do. And that's, it's a combination of um, an, an honesty and a, and a fearlessness that sort of comes from them and, a, and um, staying with their convictions. And then I'm gonna go back to creativity because I, I always will give a little bit of a, I will always give a little bit of more uh, rope to somebody who's extremely creative uh, because right. creative tends to win an awful lot of battles. Yeah, and, and and you think about creative, often part of the creative process is failure and missing the mark sometimes and having to come back to go back to the drawing board to, to try to come up with something truly great. One of the things that I admire in a new new companies that are, are starting and very who are very entrepreneurial is that the the failure is um, embraced. Yeah. And to a large degree. There is that the, the the culture of failure is thought of as something that's worthwhile because from failure you you learn and from learning you succeed, and as a combination of those things in large media companies there is oftentimes this fear of failure and by fear of failure you don't necessarily try, and quite honestly by by not trying you 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 will not sort of go beyond and succeed to your your wildest dreams, and so I would always try to encourage the idea of well let's let's try it if it doesn't work. What can we lose? If it's going to be too much, we, we may not go. I don't think you have to judge it that way. But by the same token, um, not being afraid to fail is what has made an awful lot of uh, current companies succeed. <laughs> yeah. And quite honestly, you have to embrace that strategy, particularly more in a large media company, even though it may play against you, um, for, for you to succeed. Quite honestly, you're, you are competing against uh, people who are breaking ground all the time, and you have to compete against that and be as entrepreneurial as they are. Yep. Well, I can I can think of a specific example from your business that maybe is relevant, and that my wife is co constantly watching content on Peacock, which probably would not exist. Well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it wouldn't exist if it weren't for you know external forces pushing the idea of a streaming platform you know, as, as, that's as a right. content consumption. Well, and, and that's, as I, as we sit right now in this conversation, uh, linear television is, is declining. That's not a secret. And ultimately you have to be sort of in the direct consumer streaming game as part of the mix. Obviously there's still life in many of our linear channels uh, and they are feeding um, many of the other things that we do. Quite honestly, the symphony process that we have is largely fed out of the linear channels, either on NBC Universal or lo local Comcast cable, and uh, but Peacock is a significant beneficiary of that as we move forward. Yeah, and by the way, we we consume Peacock by streaming through Comcast. We have Comcast thank, Internet. Thank you again. Cable. Thank yeah, you again. We're, we're, we're you know. Uh, so you 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 fortunately you live. We're in a customers Comcast. in a couple of different ways. <laughs> yeah, you live you live in, you live in a Comcast market. Clearly, uh, otherwise, if you were like in New York or LA where we're light, um, it would be a, sort of a different story. But I see you're in yeah. Georgia, so I, my my guess is you might be in Atlanta. We are. We are. We're in Atlanta, uh, right in the middle. You know, right in, in the middle of Atlanta. But um, so I wanted to ask you. I know for a, a, a good period of time you ran an internal agency within nbc universal nbc agency um but i assume you've also worked with external agencies over the course of your career as well so i'm just wondering you know how you would typically work with agencies both your internal group and then potentially external groups over over the last you know several it, years. it's it's a little bit different working in a media company where particularly yeah. where your your job is to create um, effectively commercials for your shows and, yeah. and, and or so that we had an internal print advertising group, we had an internal on air promotion group, which created spots. Um, and everybody we hired wanted to be a director. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we ended up doing some work. We, we, one of the reasons we became the NBC agency is we did work for, um, I think we were iVillage's first agency, snap.com, zoom.com. 
uh, and eventually NBCI became a, a client of ours and as well as the, the in other people around. And uh, so we, we, in structuring ourselves as an agency, we did uh, some things that made us like an agency, creating a, an account group and a, and, a, and a media planning group and everything else. Yeah. But that was before then. And at other times, I would go out for things that I didn't think we could do ourselves. For example, if there was a certain kind of a production that we thought that somebody else was better do going, we would go to maybe an, an agency that could just simply create material for us. We always had a buying agency because we never wanted to be in a situation when we were sort of competing against ourselves from our own sales organization. Um, so we, we would do our own planning or work with a planning agency. But for, for us, it was very important to do that. And um, for a long time, we had good relationships with with the agencies and they did buying for us. And then they would come up with um, various new ways that we might try to launch shows or be creative or deal with other media entities that they could give us special deals that we just didn't have the, 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 the time or brain power to, to go after. And so that's what was very good for us. From, from our standpoint, we ended up doing a significant amount of the creative work. I mean, the media creative work, they could do a lot of the um, media planning. The planning and buying, yeah. Yeah, right. And so that's what we looked for. Now, our film company does pretty much the same thing. Their agency does an awful lot of uh, strategy and buying and how do, how do we reach the audiences in a certain place and how do we target them so that it makes the, the thing. So, so I tend to look at what, it, what are your needs as a, I'm taking it myself out of media right now and trying to think, okay, if I was going after an agency, what can I do myself? What can the agency do for me that I can't do myself? What do they, how, do, how well do they know me? How well do they interact with my culture? And because some cultures move very quickly and some cultures move slowly. They have to understand that, that rhythm mm -hmm. and then know how that works. Um, one of the reasons it was a little bit challenging to, to have an agency work for a media company is when you're literally the, the schedules can change almost on a daily or weekly right. basis and you have to make some shifts. Agencies tend to not be geared to move that yeah. quickly. So uh, the, where we would use them is for major launches and, and things like that where we're really spending money and that's where we would bring them in for strategy of how best to uh, reach the American public of launching a new show or a movie or a film, something like, along those lines. Yeah, and you mentioned something that that I off, we often talk so set up for marketing matchmakers. We often connect brands and agencies together, and you sort of alluded to the idea of there's there's capability. You know, can the agency do the work that we need them to do? But there's also a kind of chemistry piece, which yeah. is do they mesh well with my team? Yeah, I think that that tends to be. You know, that's one of the um, things that is difficult to put a pure measurement on right, the, right, right. That, that's that sort of feel and and quite honestly for many CMOs and I, I hear this an awful lot is they feel that they have to be very good friends with their CFO because the CFO was yeah. going to say well who, how can you can you buy cheaper and right. there's, been, there's been a lot of times where we've gone around and you know almost everybody now buys by fee yeah. and quite honestly your the dollars that you're spending are on the sort of the media properties yeah. and the, the, the CFO has very little impact on that. And then sometimes the agency doesn't have that. You would go to a big agency so that they can just simply pound somebody down. Um, and quite honestly, our, the agency that we hired was the biggest pounder and they pounded our sales department. And yeah. then they would, they would come to me and say, can you give us, can you talk to your agency? And I said, well, I can, but it's, the, we encourage them to buy cheap. <laughs> right, right, right. So, um, you know that's it, it's um, it's 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 sort of an odd way to work. But I, what I would say is that for um, going after an agency, it's look for what analyze really what you need, um, what inspires you. You'll get a great you bunch get a bunch of great pitches, and then um, which ones do you think will work best with you? And and as they made their pitch, you can see you working with. For a lengthy period of time and so a lot of times when when you get a pitch you want to say okay who specifically is going to be on my account 
Yeah, right. And at, at that point, it's good to make a call about, okay, who, who are you be working with on a regular basis? What's your feeling of trust? Would you hire those people if they were working for you? And some of those are the things that you, you might do in making that final agency selection. Yeah, I, I've also found that one of the biggest variables in the agency that wins the pitch, it's the one that really wants it the most. It's the one that shows how passionate they are about the business and that they are willing to go the extra mile and put in the extra effort or the extra creative or whatever it is to win. I mean, you know, th th that usually is the winner. It, it, yeah, and, I, the, the, and, 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 or, and or has um, come in with a pitch that tends to know your business and what your needs are. Um, but, you know, it's, it's different people choose different things. And um, yeah. when, when we've selected the agency, it's usually it's somebody that came in with uh, great creative ideas, but also seemed to know our business better than anybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's never a problem. There's never a negative in bringing insights <clears throat> into the conversation that aren't obvious to the client and helping kind of educate them about that insight and getting them to nod their heads. Yes, that exists within our organization too. And then explaining why they're uniquely able to solve for that problem that you just agreed yeah. to. Yeah, the, 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 the quick turn off of an agency is somebody who comes in and presents uh, things that you, uh, after five minutes, you know, they simply don't know your business very well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a great book that I love called The Challenger Sale that talks about that approach of sort of bringing insights that show that you understand the business. Uh, I always think of the example of back in my agency days, we we pitched um, a large hotel, giant hotel chain that's based here in Atlanta. And, um, you know, you don't talk about the research you did to learn about RevPAR. You go into the conversation and say, here's how we're going to increase revenue per available room, you know, rev par. Uh, right, you just, yeah. It's part of the conversation. You don't, you don't tell them what you learned. You show them that you know. Yes. Uh, but, okay, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, you've been in a marketing role throughout your, your career. How do you show marketing's value to those non-marketing? You mentioned being, you know, tight with the CFO but how do you demonstrate the value of marketing to the non-marketing parts of the organization? Well, I think that there's usually when uh, in any sort of business setting, um, there is projections about how well a, a film will do, a show will do or anything else. Cause you've, you've had to budget based on either a ratings projection or a box office projection or an attendance projection at a theme park. And so those are your, those are sent to be your benchmarks. Yeah. Um, we, we sell off of those things. And so if you then um, market it and then beat it, okay, well, what, what, was the, what was the difference? The film didn't get better all of a sudden. Right, 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 right. At, right, the, right, at right. the time, half the time people only know what the film is from what you, how you market it anyway. Right. So um, I, I've created, had people watch a lot of bad television during my time because it was pretty <laughs> successful. Um, but so, so as a result of that, um, you can almost specifically point to the fact that marketing made the difference, at least, at least in, in my area. Right. I'll give you, give you two examples of, of how that worked. Um, in 2010, as we were sort of making, we were in between uh, meetings between Comcast and NBC Universal about how we would integrate and things like that. And I was thinking of leaving at that point after the, the merger was done. There were two things that I really wanted to make work. And one of them was in, in um, the theme park in Orlando, Universal in Orlando, um, they were just getting ready to do the Harry Potter uh, exhibit. Yeah. And um, under GE, they had not had much money, but uh, Tom Williams was a very good operator who heads the, the Orlando parks, heads up all of Universal Orlando parks, had squirreled away enough money to create this um, Orlando park for the Harry Potter world. And um, gotten the rights to do it. And it was really a magnificent thing. And I, I had spent some time with him. I said, what's the difference between you and Disney? I said, well, the problem is, is that when people think of a, uh, an Orlando vacation, they usually think of a Disney vacation. We, we needed something to put us on the radar to get maybe a day or two out of those, those vacations. And I said, okay, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. So we, we put together a kind of a task force. We made it a, what we called an Uber priority back then. Now we call it a Gold Symphony priority. And three weeks where we simply took the entire company and get it and just pounded the, the heck out of it. 
Um, at the first day, there was a eight hour waiting line for people to mm -hmm. get into to Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. And as the deal went forward, um, Comcast had put in a certain dollar value that they thought was that the, the parks were going to be worth. Um, by the end of November, uh, they were 35% above their projections wow. for a theme park. And usually that's like three or 4% yeah. is a huge hit. It was the parks had grown 35% wow. year over year. Okay. That was great content matched with great marketing. And it was a yeah. combination, combination of those two. About a month, about a month later, um, NBC Universal, which had really never had a family or clearly an animation division, had brought over a guy named Chris Melendondry from Fox who had done the Ice Age movies to create a company called Illumination Entertainment. His first film was Despicable Me. And I felt that, okay, we, it's going to put us on the map here for yeah. create, creating a, our animation studio that could perhaps someday rival um, Pixar or DreamWorks. And we just threw everything at it. I was at that point running the network and I ran a snipe, little minions running across the stream at virtually every break. And um, the, according to the people at Paramount at that time, they felt that our efforts um, probably doubled the opening of that movie. Oh, anyway, yeah. it was supposed, supposed to open at maybe about 30 or 40 million. I think we opened at about 60. It ended up doing about close to 600 million globally. And from that point on, and now is a franchise that's been worth about $6 billion in, in all of its films that have been put out. And that put a, sort of set um, Illumination uh, Entertainment on the path to be NBC Universal's DreamWorks. And then um, ironically, about five years later, we purchased DreamWorks. Uh, I have to tell you a quick, third way that we're customers of NBC Universal in that the last I have twin my wife and I have twin 11 year olds a girl and a boy and the last trip we took before COVID hit was to Universal Studios to to Harry Potter um, that was the purpose for our trip we didn't go to Disney our, our Orlando vacation was go down and stay at the Hard Rock in or you know Universal Studios Park and spent two days there and had the, the most amazing yeah. experience well, there. Once, once your kids get over 10, they usually lean a little bit more towards universal. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and they were both picked for the wand ceremony, which made their excellent. entire trip. So excellent. <laughs> Great. No, um, the, the level of detail down there at that, that park is, uh, is oh, remarkable. So good. So good. All right. So I'm going to ask you a couple of fun questions that have okay. nothing to do with anything. Just to, All right. First is just, is there a movie or a book or a quote or a band that really inspires you? You know, I saw this on the list and there is, um, I, clearly there's a number I could call to, but I'm actually gonna call to, um, <clears throat> when I was working in the first uh, iteration of, uh, at NBC Entertainment out on the West Coast from like that 85 to maybe 1983 to 86 time, there was a guy by the name of Grant Tinker who was running NBC, and he's famous for, uh, first of all, being married to Mary Tyler Moore at a time and coming <laughs> up with GTG, and they had done all the Mary, he was the producer of Mary Tyler Moore show, but he was the head of NBC at that time. A very classy guy, very honest, and NBC had been third for a long period of time, but all of a sudden we got to be, you know, getting some hits. And his quote uh, when we had the first year, we had the Cheers was on, but it was it was it was winning Emmys, but it was way down in the in the ratings. And his quote was, um, "First be best, then be first. Hmm. And we made so we said, "Gosh, that's that's you know we sort of focus on winning versus not actually being good. <laughs> right, and, right, right, right. And right. so we decided, well, let's let us be as good as we can be. Yeah. Let's be best creatively and on our shows and everything else. And from that, we will be first. And you know, we made t-shirts on it and everything else. And quite honestly, that little quote is one thing that sort of struck me. And I said, if, if, you, can, if you can do good, you will do well. Yep. And so um, that, that, that was probably one that was inspiring to me. 
Awesome. So um, is there a what what where do you find joy outside of work? Do you okay? So this is this is a little bit of an odd one. Um, for most of my life, I've enjoyed uh, barbershop quartets and barbershop quartet singing. And as a matter of fact, I'm a two-time international champion barbershop quartet singer. Wow. Um, I won one in 79, another one in 85. Bass? I sang bass, yeah. Yeah. And and um, then um, I my son got involved and then he now directs uh, some international caliber champion choruses. Huh. And he, he and I sang together in a couple of the choruses and then he I sang in one that he directed. Uh, but so I won then four additional gold medals as, in, a, in a chorus. Huh. Uh, and then, then over the course of time, um, I served on the board and was the executive vice president of the Barbershop Harmony Society. And um, uh, I decided not to go on as president because I was still working. I thought I was going to be retired and it was too much work. So I, <laughs> I bailed on that. But, but it, Barbershop and Barbershop Harmony, uh, something that I've, I've enjoyed and it's sort of like, well, what century are you living in? Uh, but uh, it's, it is um, more popular among a small subgroup than you might imagine. And um, so that's, that's one thing that's sort of uh, has continues to bring me joy outside of the me media industry. All right. I'm going to lobby you now because my wife is a very big fan of acapella generally. Okay. And we were fans of the show, The Sing Off, which uh, uh, right. was, I think it was an NBC show. It was, it was an NBC mistaken. show. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and one one of the winners there was um, who now I can't remember the name. They're, they're great. Pentatonics. Pentatonics, yes, and Huge. Um, and we we use them on a lot, a number of NBC shows, particularly for around Christmas time, things like that. Yeah, just great. Um, and the 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 bass, the original bass of a guy named Avi Cantor, yeah, also sung with my son's young person's chorus, a guy named Westminster Chorus, and um, just they were they are great. Absolutely. Well, it's fun. It's funny. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, if we could bring back a version of, of, of that show, that would be that would be fantastic. All right. That would what's be a, good. What's a brand that you've never worked on that you've always admired and, and why? Well, um, I'm going to go completely out of the, the media space, sort of, although they've kind of gotten into it. And that's Apple. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, if, if you think of the first be best and be first, I kind of think they are. Yeah. Um, they they will do an awful lot to make their product uh, as good as they can be. And then quite honestly, the, the idea of initially they were computers and then they think, well, well this computer can be in an I, iPod and then yep. you could do an iPad and then it was an yep. iPhone. And quite honestly, they, they have continually shifted from what they were. They're still a computing company, but now the computing company does something else. Plus, from a pure brand standpoint, um, they, they are about as consistent with the brand as really yeah. anything else. And so uh, not knowing exactly what the, the culture is and everything there, and they're, they're, they're massive and huge, but I sort of admire them from, from afar as being something who knows what they are and stays with it and always can tries to improve. Yeah, it's a great. Um, okay, my last, my final question for you is, is there something that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you today? It's a, it's a <laughs> curveball. I know it wasn't on the list. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about that. You, 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 we've gone into the career and yeah. I think that you, you've sort of said, well, what, what inspires you and what, what do you do and how do you spend your time? And the, the, the only thing that I, I think I would say uh, in addition to that, that you have is, is sort of what keeps you what keeps you grounded. Mm -hmm. And other than other than family, I would say that the the in, in my work situation, the idea of um, being being honest with yourself and, and and honest with the work, and which is which is odd because uh, as as a marketer, particularly in television, the, the goal is to make everything look slightly better than it actually is. Mm, right. Um, but I think you do that in a way that you can defend that with yourself and um, be as honest as possible. And I suppose more than anything else, it says what you know. What, what you said. What are your values? And it's an interesting one to say. But I would say I think that say you know on, honesty and being true to yourself are probably the ones that I would say is is important you didn't ask me that but it's sort of i'll, I'll close with the, the idea of um uh, honesty because it's always a good message 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, John Miller, I really have appreciated this time. John Miller is the chairman of the NBC Universal Marketing Council. So thank you so much for this time together. Hey, my pleasure. And um, you know, good luck with uh, anybody who happened to be listening to this. And um, hopefully there was something of, of inspiration or at least amusement in there that you can take away for, for your role.